Uh, has anybody here used it? Um, okay. Uh, you might be bored if you're an expert, but so you never know, you might le learn something, so we'll have to see. Um, okay, I'm specifically going to be looking at uh, building a RAID 1 system. Um, obviously, there are other options you can decide at the beginning if you want to use a single device or RAID 0 or RAID 10. Uh, I wouldn't recommend 5, 6 because uh, it's under very heavy development at the moment and incredibly buggy. So I'd stick to those, um, those versions of RAID if you want to use RAID. Um, okay, why ButterFS and how does it differ from other file systems? Um, okay, it's a, it's a pooling file system own built-in version of RAID, built-in support for SSDs, obviates the need for traditional petitions, that's quite interesting. Can enable sub-volumes and quotas instead of petitions, allows snap snapshots of sub-volumes, uses snapshots for backups, uses snapshots to roll back to an earlier state, and once it's set up almost everything can be done on the fly, so that again is, is a very interesting uh, concept. Um, this is my definition of a pooling file system. Uh, it's one that creates an area of common storage where data is stored. The pool can be increased in size by adding more devices or decreased by removing them. This can be achieved on the fly. This is different from traditional device partitioning schemes where fixed areas of storage or partitions are rigidly allocated to various parts of the operating system tree. Um, uh, Obviously, you have to get your own crack pass. Will these slides be online afterwards? Yes, yeah. yeah. No, obviously, I'm going to have to go through it fairly quickly, but so, yeah, they will be available. Um, so there are similarities to, um, to LVM. I, was, uh, I used to really like LVM. I used to use it a lot. Um, it, as I say, there are similarities, but uh, ButterFS t works at the file system level rather than the layer above it. Um, okay, RAID, it has its own built-in version of RAID, but uh, for anyone that's used MDADM RAID, it is, it is different. And um, the difference is that uh, when you add devices to ButterFS, it pulls all those devices, it puts them all into a pool, a data storage pool. Um, and... Uh, Consequently, um, for RAID 1, it only keeps two copies of the data and metadata, no matter how many devices you have in the pool. So you could have, uh, you could have um, a two-device RAID setup. You could have 20 devices. It will still only keep two, do two copies of the data and metadata. Um, and those two copies may be held on any two devices. Does it do variable strike weight? Like the, sorry? Vari variable strike width. You can vary it, yeah, you can vary it. You can set that up when you set it up. Well, I think you can set it up at any time. You can change it. <clears throat> One of the individual areas of things like, can you say that these two devices are on the same shell, and all three devices on different shells? No, so they all go into the pool. So when you add a device. device. It's not sort of aware of location of the device. No, no, no. You can have you can have two ButterFS systems set up. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the same system. Um, but in the one system, they're in one pool. So yeah, you could have a number of pools. But you couldn't write it across them of one. You can't say, well, um, strike over this pool and that pool. No, no. Yeah, they're they're entirely separate. Yeah. Do the components of the pool have to be similar sizes or? Um, no, you can have different size uh, devices, um, but uh, you have to, you, you can't, if, you, if you've got a, a RAID 1 set up and you've got different uh, size devices, to, to, get the, um, to use all the uh, capacity of each device, um, you have to set RAID 1 to, um, uh, to a single, uh, so it's so you set the data to single, you can set the metadata to uh, RAID 1, but you have to set RAID 1 
uh, data to single. Um, if you set RAID 1 to, um, uh, if you set uh, data to RAID 1 and metadata to RAID 1, uh, you'll lose some of the capacity of the larger drive. That's, that's how it works. So it's not smart enough if you have, say, two two terabyte drives and two three terabyte drives to go, well, I'll have two and the three on this side and two and on that side. No, you, you can't. can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have a mirror and you have, say, 12 disks, yeah. it has two copies on you. Yeah. Um, does it follow the normal RAID rules? I mean, do you have to have multiples of two for RAID 1? Oh, yes. Go, okay. You can have three, you can have four, you can have five. They, they can be um, odd numbers. Um, but it'll only keep two copies in, on that, in that pool. Of, of, so as you add a device, it adds that storage capacity to the pool, but it'll still only keep two copies. So it doesn't matter how many, how many devices you've added. You, they, they don't have to be in pairs, no. <clears throat> um, so there's built-in support for SSDs. So in your uh, uh, FS tab, you could have um, these two options added, SSD and discard. Um, <coughs> sorry, SSD, uh, it's, um, it's related to what's in, um, in the sys file system. So it's quite a long convoluted path, but uh, in sys at the end of it, um, uh, I've, there's a rotational directory or file and that's either set to one or zero. So if it's set to one, that's a traditional spinning drive. If it's set to zero, it's an SSD. So that's all SSD in the file system table tells it. Discard, of course, is um, uh, it brings discarded blocks back into the system. So it's, it's, it's quite economical to use that. <clears throat> um, it obviates the need for traditional partitioning, so you can run, you can run, sorry, you can run here, make fs dot butter fs, and then give it a bare drive slash dev slash sdx, and it'll format that bare drive with the butter fs file system. So you don't have to partition that drive first. You can just format it as a bare drive. Um, so that, that's, that's quite interesting. Um, you can format a partition if you want. Um, so you'd run makefs butterfs slash dev slash sdxx, last x being the partition. Um, there may be, there, there's probably various reasons why you'd want to do that. You might want to use uh, different file systems on the same device. Um, you may want to use a swap file. ButterFS doesn't support swap files. Um, or you may just want to have a, you may have a spare partition and you want to have a play with it, uh, in which case you can format the partition and set it up like that. <coughs> um, so you can convert an existing partition so to do that, you'd unmount the system like that, run a file system check first just to be on the safe side, and then do the conversion on it, like so. <coughs> uh, and then obviously you change your FS tab settings because uh, once you converted the device, you, you, it would have a new UUID which you'd have to enter there. That would be the mount point, butterfs file system, and make sure these two are set to zero. You don't want a file system check set to one. It's got to be zero. <coughs> um, right, then you can reboot. And if all is well, you can delete this file, which has been saved for you by the butterfs convert tool. So if you're converting a petition from X4, for example, it'll save, save it in X2 format um, so that if anything goes wrong, you can roll back to that, uh, to that save. That, that's basically, that's an image of your former operating system. So it keeps that for you. So if anything goes wrong, you can roll back to it. 
Um, so you delete, you, you best not to just delete it in the normal fashion. Uh, you run the butterfs command, butterfs sub volume delete, x2 saved. The reason you use the sub volume command is because that's actually saved as a sub volume. We'll get on to sub volumes in a minute. Um, if there is a problem, as I say, you can roll back. So don't, don't delete that file that's been saved. You can mount it as a sub volume and, uh, and that'll bring you back to the original state of the system. <clears throat> this is quite important. Um, someone I know had this problem. They did a conversion. Um, they had X2 saved on their system and they forgot all about it and all of a sudden they started getting weird errors happening and uh, it was because she'd forgotten to delete um, X2 saved. And the reason you start to get strange errors is because that is the image of the former system which presumably is formatted in something like X4 so it, it doesn't play very well with the ButterFS system. And every time you use the system, it adds things, tries to add things to this file. So once you're, if you're doing a conversion, once you're certain that it's working all right, the first thing you should do is delete that, that file, as I showed here, using, um, using this command here. <coughs> Okay, um, this is just a point of interest, really. It's a, it's a, bit, of a bit of an aside. <coughs> um, we always boot our systems from a 16 gigabyte USB flash drive. Um, the reason we do that is because um, is because the um, you can take uh, one, once you've set it up, and this this is how we set it up. So it's 16 gigabytes, and we give 100 megabytes to boot, 9 gig to swap, and nearly 6 gig to a rescue uh, system that we have on there. So we found that the, the benefit of this is that um, once you've set one of these up, you can clone it with DD, and uh, you can then boot any other box from it. So we find that really useful and also the fact that it has its own rescue operating system on the flash drive so if anything does go wrong you can boot it from that and then you can uh, you can tinker with the uh, the butterfs system so obviously you don't have to do that but we found that uh, we found that to be really useful um, we also use G-Disk. I suppose everyone knows uh, about G-Disk and GPT petitions. They're, they're a later form uh, of uh, petitioning uh, compared to the MBR, traditional MBR, um, where, where the MBR you only had, you were stuck with obviously four uh, primary petitions and there was that kludge added so uh, where you could have an extended petition and it gave you some more. With GDisk, um, right from the get-go, it gives you um, gives you a whole number of petitions. So it's not really useful on uh, something that's only petition with three petitions, but um, it's the more modern way of doing things. So you know that's why we use it. Um, we also use again. This is a bit a uh, bit of an aside, but we also use SysLinux to to boot on this. Uh, on this flash drive, so we have SysLinux on here rather than Grub. Um, the reason we don't use Grub is because we think Grub 2 now has become ridiculously bloated. Um, Grub legacy was great. Uh, um, you know, we always use, used to use that, but uh, since Grub 2 has been developed further, it, we just find it, it's uh, it's overcomplicated and over bloated, and Sys Linux is really nice. It's uh, it's small, it's light, it's fast. Have they ported Emacs to Grub 2 yet? Sorry? Have they ported Emacs to Grub 2 yet? Emacs? 
<laughs> I don't use Emacs. Can I just say, I think the question is more, have they put it to the Emacs? Okay, but you can download it there, and uh, I think it's worth, uh, I think it's worth doing. Get rid of Grub too. That's my that's my opinion. Um, okay, before you start, you really want to um, download the latest kernel and ButterFS progs. The uh, ButterFS is built into the kernel, and the user space tools are in ButterFS progs. So I think the latest stable kernel at the moment is 3.19.2 from kernel.org. Uh, for the latest ButterFS progs, you want to run this command here. If you don't have Git installed, then obviously you'll have to install it first. Um, but you really want to, to be up to date when you start. Um, I don't believe any of the distro repositories have the latest versions of either. I mean, I'm not an expert on distros. Um, yeah, I'm not an, actually. I, I'm not actually an expert. At, I, don't, I don't like the term expert because, um, in it, from experience over the years, I've come across a number of people who claim to be experts, and they've actually turned out to be of the type where X was the unknown quantity and Spurt was a drip under pressure. So, you know, it has uh, bad connotations. Um, okay, uh, so download the latest kernel. Download the latest. Uh, ButterFS progs, build those against the, uh, the new kernel, and uh, then we're ready to format um, our device, RAID 1, as a root file system. This is, this is what I'm going to run through. Obviously, you've got all sorts of different options, but um, this is what I'm looking at today. So once you've got all those in place, you'd run this command here, make fs ButterFS. Uh, M is for metadata, set as RAID 1. D is for data, set as RAID 1. And here are your two devices that you're going to, um, you're going to install as RAID 1. <clears throat> so that's all, that's all you need to do. Um, obviously, you'd need to do this for a rescue system or connect the two devices via USB to a build system or another system because you'd, you'd have to set that up, obviously, before you can boot into it. <clears throat> Um, yeah. Uh, so again, change your FS tab settings. So a new UUID, it'll be root, butter FS. And then you want to list the, the devices so. So this, these are in the file system table options. Device equals dev SDA, device equals dev SDB. And again, zero, zero at the end. Um, I, I think you only have to list the devices like that if you don't have an um, initial RAM disk. We don't use an initial RAM disk. Um, so I think, I think I'm not certain. I think you can get away without listing those two devices. You can just list one. Um, but uh, as I say, we don't use an initial RAM disk. We f just find it an unnecessary uh, thing to do um, on our systems anyway. Um, and obviously, uh, under your options, there'd be a whole load more options, comma separated lists going on. And for all the options that you're able to use, you can obviously look on kernel.org, and they've got a list of kernel mount options there, which include the uh, the ButterFS options. If you look, it's the ButterFS wiki on kernel.org. <coughs> So the first thing you should do before you do anything else is create some sub-volumes. The reason for that is um, that sub-volumes give you flexibility. Once you've set up some sub-volumes, you, um, you can mount them, you can unmount them, uh, you can create more space on them, you can create quotas, as we'll see in a minute. Um, if you don't do that, it, it, it's much more locked down than it needs to be. So before you do anything else, uh, you create some sub-volumes. And what I do is create a sub-volume for root, so um, that you'd hold your root file system in that sub-volume. 
Uh, you don't have to call it root. That's an arbitrary. Um, sorry, that's an arbitrary uh, label. You can call it whatever you like, but obviously root makes more sense. You can create further subvolumes. So you do butterfs subvolume create maybe home. Maybe you want a separate one for home. Maybe a separate one for var. So that uh, you know in the traditional way log files don't run away with the system. Um, you may want to create one for opt. It's up to you. You can create whatever subvolumes you want. It's that flexible. You, you need to decide. We well, don't need to decide beforehand. Um, you can create some of them, and you can create some after. But um, it's easier to do it uh, from the beginning. Can you promote a directory to a subvolume later? Sorry? Can you promote a directory to a subvolume? Yeah, I'll show you in a minute. <laughs> You're ahead of me. Um, so you'd mount your additional subvolumes so. So the UUID would be the same in each case. That would be the UUID of the, uh, the RAID 1 array. Um, so the mount point for root would be so, and you'd have subvolume equals root. So that would boot into that subvolume. The root file system would be in that subvolume. Uh, if you had a home subvolume, you could mount it so, subvolume equals home. And then that would be mounted, uh, then your home directory, as you were just asking, would be on that subvolume. Um, same with var, and same with opt, same with any other subvolumes that you wanted to create. <coughs> yeah? Um, normally it's taught in uh, that uh, for the root file system at least, the mm -hmm. last two you may have got from system one. Um, I was just curious why that's not the case. Here. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. So normally um, it's taught that for your root file system, the two numbers at the end yeah. are one. Uh, just something quite. Uh, yeah, uh, because um, uh, you don't want to run. Uh, there was um, a butterfs file system check that was developed at one stage during development. But the recommendations by the ButterFS devs now is not to use it. So you don't want it to do an automatic uh, check of the file system. So you set that to zero rather than one. <clears throat> OK, there is a default subvolume, uh, which is always created when you create a ButterFS system. And that's typically, uh, that, that's the label it's given, 0 slash 5. And, and the system will boot into that, that uh, default subvolume, um, unless you do this. So you're telling it now not to boot into the, uh, into the um, default subvolume, but to boot into the subvolume of root. And the same here with home, var, and opt. So if you don't do any of that, it'll just boot into this subvolume here. And as I said earlier, um, that's not really a problem, but it makes it far less flexible. Uh, you, you can always change it later, but you can't change it on the fly. You'd have to use a rescue disk or something like that and, and get into it and change it. Obviously, what if you if if it's a root file system, you, you can't really do that. You can't change that. Um, and that. And that one can never be deleted. You can, you can create and you can delete any other subvolume you like. But that master one, the, the default, that can never be, never be deleted. That's always there. And the other subvolumes that you create um, will be at a level below that. Uh, Sorry? Um, that's just the name it's been given. There's, there's no significance really other than that, uh, that that's the, just the label that the, the root files, the root subvolume has, has been given by the ButterFS developers. Um, and you can toggle a default subvolume um, with this command here ButterFS subvolume set default, and you give it the ID of the subvolume and the path to it. Um, the benefits of doing that are that um, um, 
you can move the view of the file system about. So if, if you set the default to uh, um, a sub-volume which is lower down in the tree, you can't see any of the sub-volumes above it, but you can see all the sub-volumes that are created below it. Um, so that, that, you know, that might be useful in some circumstances, particularly when you're taking, um, uh, we'll come to that in a minute, snapshots of the sub-volumes. You may want to move up the tree and take a, a snapshot and then come down the tree again. <clears throat> quotas. Okay, quotas can be applied to all the sub, all or any sub volumes, and to apply a, 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 a make sure that your ButterFS system um, has quotas enabled. Just run ButterFS quota enable, and of course it's the root file system that we're dealing with here. Um, and that'll that'll enable you to run or to uh, to make to give quotas to any of the file to any of the sub volumes that you've created. But you must do this as well before creating your sub volumes. It's easier to do it that way. So once you've created your uh, ButterFS system, before you create the sub volumes, run that command, and then uh, and then create your sub volumes afterwards. Um, What's the reason that that's, is that doing something like counting or something? What is it that's Yeah, um, this might answer you here. <laughs> so um, once you set quotas, you can apply your limits. An example here, you, if you run ButterFS Q group, that's quota group, limit 1G slash var. So that would create a limit to your... Um, slash var directory in effect which is mounted on that sub the sub volume which is mounted on that and it would limit it to one gig so um, the thing with quotas is of course and butterfs as I, as I said before you've got a pool and if something really runs away uh, with the capacity it could use up that whole pool and bring down the operating system so it's a really useful thing to be able to uh, to give quotas to uh, to uh, your, your directories. So it, it's a bit like, um, so as I say, that, that would limit the size of slash var to one gigabyte. Um, so it, it's a bit like, um, uh, it's a bit like the traditional partition system. So a sub volume with quotas is like a, a separate partition where you've got a fixed, uh, fixed capacity and it, uh, the data can't extend beyond that limit. By giving quotas to, um, to sub-volumes, you're creating a similar setup to a, a traditional partition system. So that, that's, that's really useful to be able to do that. Yeah? Um, the normal quota, um, normally quota refers to a user quota. Am I thinking that this is rather per file? Yeah, this is per sub-volume. Okay. How, how much do you do per user um, I think you can, but I'm not certain. I, I'm afraid I can't answer that. I don't know. I th I've got a feeling you can. You, you'd have to have a look um, on the ButterFS wiki. That would probably tell you that's the best place to go for information on kernel.org. But I'll, I've got the um, I've got the links to that later, so you'll be able to see. And as I say, as I said earlier, the, the, sh the slides will be available, so you'll be able to have a look at that. So snapshots. Um, once you've got your um, sub volumes, you can take snapshots, and snapshots are just special sub volumes, so they're like a sub volume. Um, but uh, it, it's, uh, what it does, it, it fixes the system in time. So you can take a snapshot of a sub-volume and save it. And the basic example of snapshotting is this. You run ButterFS sub-volume snapshot. So you wanted to take a snapshot of your home um, sub-volume, and then you'd save it to home snapshot. You can also add date and time information onto here so that... Uh, you can see exactly when the snapshot was taken, uh, the hour, the day, the year. Um, and uh, there are already some tools that will automate this. Yep, sorry. 
I was going to ask, does it do clever copy on white cap stuff to avoid doing right. out space? Yeah, yeah. And does it solve the problem you have with LVM where you, your snapshots keep getting full? Does it solve that problem? It does, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so uh, there are some snapshots and backup tools already available that use ButterFS send receive. Um, it's, it's easier and better to use this than our sync and ButterFS send receive will actually send uh, snapshots to a, another device somewhere else. Um, so it's a really useful command that ButterFS had a built-in command. Um, you can choose one of these tools to automate your backups. Um, there are these three that I found. One's written in Python, one's written in Perl, that one's written in Java. <laughs> uh, yeah, my favorite is the second one. Um, it's, a, it's, it's quite nice. Here's the link to it. Have a look. But, you know, it's your choice. Make your choice. Um, it's a free country, I think. Just, maybe. Wow. Who knows? <laughs> um, yeah, so, so those, you, can download, you can have a look at those tools and you can set them up quite easily. And that'll do your backups for you. <clears throat> Um, okay, as I say, we don't use an initial RAM disk. I know all the distributions do, but we build our own systems, so, and we've chosen not to do that. It, it just makes it more complicated for us than it needs be. Um, so if anyone else is uh, trying to boot without an initial RAM disk, um, there's a patch here for the kernel, because quite often you find that um, using ButterFS, um, particularly a RAID 1 um, array, um, for some reason the kernel tries to lo load the root FS too fast and you have to slow it down. So there's a patch here. Um, it doesn't work with any, every kernel version, that's what we found anyway. Um, but uh, to say the good news is there's not much to change in the file. I think there's only two or three lines of code in the file, so it's quite easy to hack each kernel version manually. Um, but you, you generally need to do that if you're booting to a, a RAID 1 ButterFS without an initial RAM disk. <coughs> Is there a reason you want to not have an ID or an RAM disk? Well, we find yeah. it unnecessary. Yeah. Uh, it's more complicated. I just want to have another layer on top of everything. I, I wonder whether you can have like a null in your RAM disk that does nothing and just make a false thing. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know that if that would work. <laughs> You'd have to try it. Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, testing the file system. Once you've got it up and running, um, run butterfs fi show fi for file system, show root, <coughs> root file system, and you'll find it may return this, and the key here is some device is missing. Um, and uh, we found it's just an annoying message. Um, to do anything, the devices are recognized. It is usable. Um, but it, it, as I say, it comes up with this message. So just to get rid of that, uh, if, if for nothing else, if you run ButterFS device scan after it's booted, um, and then if you run ButterFS file show root again, you'll find that the, that annoying message has disappeared and you've got your two drives here listed as device SDV1, device SA1. Um, now, to avoid doing all this manually, of course, you can add ButterFS device scan to a boot script. So when it runs, it'll automatically run that, and you won't get that message. And this should come up just as it should be. <clears throat> um, you want to scrub your file system um, fairly regularly. I don't know what, don't ask me what regularly is. No one seems to know. I think it depends how much data you've got on the system. Um, but there's never any harm to run it more than perhaps you'd want to. So you'd run ButterFS scrub start root, and then it'll, it'll check all the metadata and data against the checksums, and make sure everything's all right. We had a, a problem with um, corrupted data at one point. And uh, this, this just sorted it out for us. Uh, it, was, it was fine after we ran that. 
we'd forgotten to run it for a while, and uh, I think that's what caused the problem. So it's worth running that regularly. And you can test the progress with butterfs scrub status forward slash. Um, uh, if you run the status at any time as well, it'll tell you when the last scrub happened. So uh, if you've forgotten when you ran it last, you can find out by running that. And again, well, you can run this as a cron job um, so that, you, again, you don't have to do it manually. And then you can set it up so I don't know, run once a week or, or whatever, whatever you think. You'll have to make that decision. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so I talked about corrupted data. Um, obviously, if you're booting into a root file system, it probably won't boot. Um, so uh, what you need to do is uh, boot it with, you add this to your kernel line, boot line, root flags equals degraded. And that'll tell ButterFS that uh, one of the drives is degraded and it needs to boot into it just using uh, one, one device. So that's, that's a kernel boot parameter. So if you're using Grub, obviously, uh, stop it from booting and add that and then carry on. Uh, but, you know, use, it's the same whichever bootloader you're using. Grub, Sys, Linux, it's the same. Uh, right, so if you've got a failed device, um, you first, especially if you've only got two devices on, that are running RAID 1, um, that's obviously the absolute minimum. So you can't just take one out. So what you have to do is you have to add a third device first. So ButterFS device add, then you add the device to root. Then you might receive a device missing warning. Um, device Device missing is actually a proper device as far as ButterFS is concerned. Um, and you might get that if you run ButterFS by show, get a device missing. So if you do, all you have to do is run ButterFS device delete missing. As I say, missing for ButterFS is, is a, a proper, proper device. And it's the one that's become corrupted. So it will remove that. And if you've added the other one first, you're back to two, two good drives. Um, so the summary of steps necessary for that, mount in degraded mode here, add the new device, remove the missing device. Once you've run that command, you can then physically remove it and then rebalance the data and metadata with this command, <coughs> butterfs balance start, data convert equals raid one, Metadata convert equals RAID 1, and it's the root file system. Uh, yeah. Can you preemptively replace? So you've got a device that shows smart errors. You can, yeah. yeah. Um, you, can, you can remove and add devices at any time you like. Well, what I was thinking more that in ZFS, similar design, and also in MDADM, you can say, this device which is still functional but showing errors, mm -hmm. I want to replace with this device, and you can copy. All the data. You don't need to, to copy it physically. Yeah, yes, yeah. in this case, it's more that you, you're never running at risk. Yes, yeah. you've always got to copy. Yes, you, you, yeah, you can do that. As I say, you can, add and, uh, you can add and remove devices at any time you like, but always run the balance command afterwards, and then that just balances the data and metadata between all the devices once again. So you should be back where you started. So I was going to ask to clarify, so you said earlier with RAID 1 on ButterFS yeah. that you only ever keep two copies yeah. of, was that data or metadata? Oh, both. Both. Yeah. So if you've still got your degraded device in there and you have a new device and you're rebalancing it, yeah. will it, will there be three copies at that time until you remove the degraded device? Or will there be a point where it says one copy when you remove the degraded device? Um, if you um, booted it with, in degraded mode, it'll see that as a device missing. It'll call that device missing, as I say. Um, so you'll have to remove it. Um, yeah, but well, I mean, at the point that you rebound, will it make sure that, that, that there is three copies, including the copy on the degraded device, so that at the point you remove the degraded device, there's still two copies? Yeah, yeah but it does that automatically. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay. Yeah, as long as you follow that procedure here, you should be all right. <clears throat> 
uh, checking for free disk space. Where am I up to? Um, yeah, uh, use this invocation here. ButterFS has its, its own DF tool uh, within it. So you want to run ButterFS by DF ButterFS mount point. Uh, and not this. Um, if you use the GNU Core Utils version, you'll get a. Um, it'll uh, it'll tell you've got more space left than you have. Uh, you can test each one and see the difference, but this is the one to use. Um, there's an abbreviation of commands. Um, you've probably seen it as I've gone through. I haven't been consistent with the uh, with the commands. So sub equals sub-volume, phi equals file system. Um, there's no definitive list of shortened forms and you can make them up as you go along. I think that's quite cool. Um, so a shortened form failed example. If instead of butterfs sub-volume list, we attempted butterfs s l, just the initial letters of those two commands, the parser would return ambiguous token s did you mean one of these, sub-volume, scrub, or send? Well, we can see from that that uh, if we used SU instead of just S, that wouldn't have conflicted with either of these two. So you could, you could then run butterfs SUL, and it would complete as expected. Um, the parser operates on a contextual basis, so it won't give you every command here that begins with S, it'll just give you the commands that you would use with list. So I, as I say, I think that's really cool. If you're doing, running a lot of commands, it saves you a lot of time in typing. Um, okay. Uh, so there's help from the web, um, many how-tos on the web. Here are three links here. Um, this is the main one, the butterfs wiki, kernel.org. Um, that's the main, that takes you to the main page, and then from yeah. there you can get to any other page. It's all split up into pages. Um, Arch Linux, of course, always good. Um, lots of information on there. Um, and this is a really simple one. How, I quite like it, A Beginner's Guide to Butterfairs, because it's really simple and straightforward and step by step. But they do make a mistake, I've noticed, and they leave one in the column for file system check. And as I said earlier, that should be zero. Um, so acknowledgements. I know this is Jared Beekman's nothing to do with, LF, with um, ButterFS, but he's the man behind Linux from scratch who made it possible initially for us to build our battery powered solid state servers from, from scratch. So I'd, li I'd like to give him an acknowledgement there. Um, ButterFS on Freenode, a great source of help and advice. All the devs uh, <laughs> hang out on there. And of course, Chris Mason, who's the, who's the lead developer of ButterFS. Um, thank you. And that's it. I was Richard Melville. I work for Cellularity Limited. As I say, we build battery powered solid state uh, servers. Um, that's my Twitter handle email address. Any questions? I don't know if there's time. Are you, we've got this in the agenda for the next project. Oh, yeah. what time? Are you? Um, so, the exception of Grade 5 6 you mentioned earlier. Um, the exception of uh, uh, Grade 5 and 6. Yeah, yeah. Do you consider the Grade 1 version to be like production and ready for all sorts Oh, yeah. RAID 0, RAID 1, and RAID 10, they're fine. It, it's just that not much work prior to this has gone into 5 6. Um, and it's under rapid development at the moment. It's very, very buggy, so wouldn't recommend using it at all. But RAID 0 is much like MDADM RAID, um, you know, striping across as many devices you've got, but no redundancy. Uh, RAID 1 is, as I said, just keeps two copies, and RAID 10 is built on those presets. So, yeah, you can use uh, either of those three. It's, it's fine. Nothing else? No? Yeah. On which group? Yeah. And then you root in your scrub. Yeah. Would you put that scrub all in some volume? Yes. Yeah. I will do. It's different.
because that, that'll sorry because that'll work on that default sub volume which is zero slash five. So uh, it'll it'll scrub all those un underneath it. Sorry, as I say, it, it, it's different meanings of the word root. Right? We've got different meanings of the word root. Yes, yes. Root, root has to be named for volume, but yeah. root also means scrub the Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah? I was going to say, presumably on that note, because you mentioned about the whole zero slash five thing, you, yeah. you've got the triad in the past and how they're mounted, but presumably you also have the triad in the structure inside Butter FX. Yeah. Maybe there's a, there's a difference there depending on what you've mounted where. Yeah. So when you do scrub slash, are you talking about slash and what has it what's currently mounted as slash? Or as in the very top of the buffer file system underneath it. The top of the file system, yeah. So it'll scrub the whole thing, yeah. <coughs> yep. Only it kind of worms, but one of the use Sorry? Sorry? Only kind of worms. One of the use LFS, which is far more mature. Yeah, if you're using. Like Staggered out for Really? Yeah, yeah, but if you're using Linux, <laughs> it's not built into the kernel. You can use views. But, but that's the kernel systems, I mean, for a distribution, mm -hmm. they have a licensing problem for setting it And if you're building your own systems, so I like you have a licensing problem for building your own systems as well. Mm -hmm. Because you're distributing these binary and having to put into a piece of kit. Um, but yeah, I, I'm a huge set of best fans, so I'll. Oh. I'll say it with that one. A huge fan of what? Sorry. A huge fan of set of best. Set of best, although it's not Squire or something yeah. else. Um, and. <laughs> ZFS has its drawbacks, it's mm -hmm. immensely round on grading, it yeah. has licensing issues, mm -hmm. um, but it's got a really good tooling set around it. Well, it's had a lot more development, yes. it's had the years behind it, which uh, ButterFS hasn't, but no, no, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure it'll get there eventually. There's a massive amount of development still going into it. Uh, and as you say, ZFS is incredibly resource hungry, yes. far more so than yeah. ButterFS. You know, you make your choice, it's up to you. No one's saying you have to use this over something else. But, um, the reason this was developed in the first place was because of the licensing issues. But they'll never be able to use it in the kernel um, because of the license that ZFS is released. It's also because it beats ZFS developers to sort the license out. It's also because it beats ZFS developers to sort their licensing out. Yeah. <laughs> so on, on that point, obviously, an Oracle distributed on their Oracle and Oracle Linux, they ported some of the uh, Dtrace stuff as GPL for that. Although I've not seen it appear in any other distributions yet. Well, I, I wonder if they'll do any of the same with ZFS. The, ZFS hasn't moved much. One of the ZFS hasn't moved much since Oracle took over. ZFS within Oracle is mostly static. It's now mostly static. Uh, is that where you're at? The element of that. Um, that's, that's not entirely true. It's been developed in medicine, but they're working. And they will not tell you what they've done. Well, no, it's, it's closed source. It's, it's closed source, yeah. yeah. But they've got all the encryption stuff in. Yeah. Got a huge, I, uh, I think they've put their money on battery first, haven't they? I mean, they, Chris I mean, Mason used to work for Oracle. And yeah, it all started so within Oracle. Came out of Oracle first. So they are still the copyright holder. <coughs> Okay, so then. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you.